Perry, and I have to start this hour by giving a big birthday shout out to the ACA. Happy third birthday, ACA. Woo! That's right. It is the third birthday of President Obama signing the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, as it has come to be known. And ACA is one of the most expansive pieces of social legislation in decades. Americans that have been excluded from receiving basic health care because of cost or pre-existing conditions will finally have access to health insurance and care. And the promise of ACA is great, but that doesn't mean that the implementation will be easy. It is true that since 2010, 66 out of 72 provisions of the act have already been implemented. But as we've noted before, coverage doesn't necessarily equal care. In 2014, ACA will extend coverage to roughly 30 million Americans. However, by 2015, estimates show there will be a shortage of nearly 63,000 years in the United States. And although the Supreme Court upheld the ACA in June, that does not mean the end of legal challenges. Cases that are still pending in different federal courts challenge the employer coverage requirements, contraceptive coverage rules, and the Independent Payment Advisory Board. And there are still those members of Congress trying to repeal or chip away at the ACA. Friday marked the 39th, yes, the 39th time that Republicans have tried to repeal the law in the past two years. 39 times. Then there's the most important component, the patient. According to a recent poll, 48% of people don't even know if their state is going to offer a health insurance exchange. So... I'm sorry, but maybe the birthday party isn't so great after all, because if you hope to get another one, we're going to have to get ourselves together. At the table, Democratic Congresswoman Gwen Moore of Wisconsin, Rebecca Oney, co-founder and CEO of Health Leads, Jay Angoff, the man who until recently was inside the Obama administration and responsible for the implementation of President Obama's health care law, and NBC Latino contributor Victoria DeFrancesca Soto. So, Jay, I just want to start with you. What has been accomplished in the last three years? Well, a lot's been accomplished. Kids can stay on their parents' policies until they're 26. Insurance companies can't, off, can't cut off coverage once you reach a certain limit. They can't cancel coverage. And most importantly, insurance companies that spend more than 20 cents of the premium dollar on administrative expenses and, and uh, profit, they've got to refund money to people. And, and in 2012, people around the country got more than a billion dollars back from their insurance companies that did not comply with this rule. Yeah. So a lot's been accomplished so far, but there's, there's more to come. And yet, Congresswoman Moore, I wonder, when you talk to your constituents, are people feeling the ACA? I mean, when we looked at some of the data, it says that, that people are, are saying, oh, I haven't even been personally, in, even if, in fact, they have been personally, they have the sense of, I haven't been personally impacted by this. Well, I can tell you, young people uh, who have been able to stay on their parents' insurance until they're 26 have certainly uh, been the first group of beneficiaries. Yeah. I've heard from people who had not been able to get coverage for their children uh, because of pre-existing conditions, and it's had an impact on them. I think that the hurry to repeal uh, the Affordable Care Act is because people don't want to see the benefits uh, in order to people because it'll be just like Medicare. They won't want you to mess with it. Certainly, we've seen like $5.7 billion nationally uh, uh, benefit uh, seniors who've seen the donut hole close. Yeah. And maybe they take that for granted, but they surely won't once the donut hole reoccurs. So, so, so let me ask and, and yeah, just, yeah, just one other point. Yeah. People talk about how this is going to have a terrible impact on small businesses. Mm. 360,000 small businesses have taken advantage of uh, the Affordable Care uh, uh, tax uh, credits already. Right. So, so if we, when we have legislation that is this good, that is this historic, that is this potentially enormous, Rebecca, it feels to me like the question isn't get. I mean, now the legislation through, now it is it is constitutional, but how do we make sure that it is? implemented that people feel it yeah no it has to be real and you know, I think one of the um, perhaps victories of the ACA is that it's triggered actually a whole set of forces that are now really causing us to be able to shift at last from a sick care system to a health care system you know from a system that financially rewards bad health outcomes like emergency room visits and hospital admissions to one that can at last really focus financial resources and the time of health care providers on keeping people healthy and when you say 
focusing us on a health care as opposed mm -hmm. to sick care. So you use the emergency room as one example. The other thing I know you've talked about is having to just doctors yeah. to provide our care. What does that look like? No, I think one of the opportunities here is to look more expansively at what uh, what counts as a health care provider mm -hmm. and to go beyond just doctors, but to really say if we had a team in place that was there to keep patients healthy, what would we spend their time on and how would we think about really um, devoting resources in the clinic to address some of those factors that have a huge impact on patients' health, like you know whether they can pay their electricity bill to keep mm -hmm. the refrigerator on, to keep their medications cold, for example. Right, right. This much broader conception of what constitutes health. Vicki, when the president signed the bill, he said the core principle that everybody should have some basic, that this is about the core principle that everybody should have some basic security when it comes to their health care, kind of setting a, a health care floor. How close are we to achieving that? The legislation is in place. We've talked about that, but for me, the biggest frustration is the lack of public knowledge. We saw a recent poll come out saying that 80% of people who would be most affected from the health care law, uh, mainly poor folks, Medicaid recipients, didn't know enough about the affordable health care law. I think about in 2009, when we went for the digital transition for TV from analog to digital, you were bombarded with information. You could not turn on the TV or the radio without making sure your TV set was ready for the transition. I, someone who lives out of the Beltway, do not feel that there has been sufficient information to the layperson about um, what you need to do depending on your situation for affordable health care. So, so Jay, how come you guys, uh, look, this is the application for health care, right? We have, to, and it, it is not brief. Some of it is redundant, right? Some of this if you don't have four people, but this is a big old document. For all the good you guys did in creating this policy, it feels like you failed on the conversational piece. That's a 21-page application, and that's too long. Yeah. It's got to be shortened. But let me say this. We have a system, we've got a fragmented system. There's Medicaid, both run by the government. There's the Children's Health Insurance Program run by the government. There's also private health insurance. And so because of, the, because of that fragmented system, there's going to be more complexity than there would be, for example, in a single-payer system mm -hmm. or if there were a Medicare for all system. So there's going to be some complexity. In addition, most people are going to go to the Internet and punch in the answers to a few questions rather than use the paper application. Also, as you said, many of those pages are not relevant to most people. But all that said, yeah, it's got to be shortened. It's got to be shortened. I feel like I want you to say those words again, which is Medicare for all and single, single payer. Because those were the things that, that moved off the agenda as possibilities in the context of managing all of, of the politics of this. As horrifying as it is, there have been 39 challenges to a three-year-old law. Is there any possibility those challenges might open us to actually moving more in that direction, single payer or Medicare for all? Well, I don't think those challenges will, but if this fails, I mean, this, the Affordable Care Act, for better or worse, relies on private insurance companies. Mm -hmm. The concept is we're going to structure the market so that private insurance companies have to compete. Therefore, they'll have an incentive to reduce their own administrative costs and to drive down underlying health care costs. If private insurance companies fail at that, then I think there very well could be a, pri a, a, a single-payer system. Uh. Now, I'm optimistic this will work, right. but the private, ins the private health insurance industry has a huge stake in making this work. Oh, and that, that may, in fact, be the most optimistic thing I've heard. If they have a stake in making it work, it, it's a little bit like how I know that the NFL is always going to manage to, to deal with this labor contract, right? There's just too much money to be lost. Stay right there, because when we come back, I'm going to ask the Congresswoman about one of her colleagues, Congresswoman Michelle Bachman. She opened her mouth.